Hello, welcome. I'm Kate Mackay, Associate Film Curator here at the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. At the same time we are reopening our Barbara Osher Theater for screenings this fall, we are delighted to be able to continue some wonderful online programs. I'm very happy that you are joining us here for this illuminating conversation with Professor Lee Rayford and Pratiba Parmar about Parmar's 1991 documentary, A Place of Rage, a film that Rayford aptly describes as a fierce and loving assessment of the social movements of the 1960s from the vantage point of the 1990s culture wars. Still relevant 30 years later, it is now also an invaluable historical document, so I hope you take some time to have a look at it. This conversation and streaming presentation of A Place of Rage are presented in conjunction with UC Berkeley's Department of African American Studies year-long critical conversation series, which this year is devoted to a celebration of the life and legacy of writer, activist, and longtime UC Berkeley faculty member, June Jordan. And just a couple of words before, with, about our conversants before I turn it over to them. Pratiba Parmar is an award-winning filmmaker who brings a passionate commitment to illuminating untold stories with her bold explorations of the visual medium. Her credits include Alice Walker, Beauty and Truth, and A Place of Rage. Parmar's film Kush was one of the first films to give vis visibility to the experiences of LGBT people in India. A globally recognized filmmaker and human rights activist, Parmar's accomplishments have been recognized with multiple awards, including the Icon Award in 2017, presented by the Bagari London Indian Film Festival in association with the British Film Institute for outstanding contribution to Indian and world cinema. She is author of several books and was a visiting artist at Stanford in 2014. She is currently an associate professor in the film program at the California College of the Arts in San Francisco, and she is a member of the Directors Guild of America, as well as the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts, and Sciences. Professor Lee Rayford is an associate professor of African American Studies here at UC Berkeley where she teaches, researches, curates, and writes about race, gender, justice, and visuality. She is author of Imprisoned in a Luminous Glare, Photography, and the African-American Freedom Struggle, and co-editor with Heike Rafael Hernandez of Migrating the Black Body, Visual Culture, and the African Diaspora. And she's also co-editor with Rene Romano of The Civil Rights Movement in American Memory. She is the inaugural director of the Black Studies Co-Laboratory, a multi-sited, multi-generational initiative funded by uh, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation to amplify the world-building work of Black Studies. So I'll turn it over to Lee Rayford and Pratiba Parmar now, and I hope you enjoy this wonderful conversation. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Pratiba, for agreeing to do this conversation, um, for letting us screen your fabulous film, A Place of Rage, which um, I think, as I've said, I've told you before, it was really, it's, it's one of the touchstone um, feminist, feminist of color films um, that, that really shaped me as, an, as a young black femme, femme budding feminist scholar, um, and I, I wanted to start by asking you to talk a little bit of, about the genesis um, of A Place of Rage and, and how you came to the idea um, uh, and it just how, how it came to be. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Lee, for asking me to do this. I realized that I, in um, thinking about our conversation today, that actually this year is 20, uh, no, 30 year anniversary of A Place of Rage. 30 years ago, I made this film, which is like, you know, sort of quite, um, it, it kind of overpowered me when I kind of really sort of thought about the length of time um, and how the film came about. Um, 
primarily, I think the film came, first of all, from a political kinship with June Jordan and June's writings, which subsequently became a, a friendship with June Jordan and then became a kind of very family kind of uh, kinship with, with June over the years. And um, I was introduced to June's writings when um, uh, in London by uh, uh, a friend, Paul Gilroy, who I had been a postgraduate student with at the University of Birmingham at the Contemporary Cultural Studies Center where uh, Stuart Hall was the professor. Um, and when Paul gave me um, Civil Wars, June's uh, collection of essays as a birthday present, I was just um, like completely blown away by the writing. I think that I had never read anything that was so uh, deeply political and incisive, but this um, with this poetry and passion and a kind of very, very personal lens. So that that kind of way in which she was able to bring in the very intimate moments from her own life and then extrapolate to talking about global um, you know, movements of colonization and oppression and apartheid. Uh, it was just a revelation to me. And you know, in the film, uh, Trinity Minha, uh, the Vietnamese filmmaker uh, say, says um, that June has with her words and poems, this ability to walk right into your heart. And I think that June did that for me when I first read that uh, uh, her book and and then to be then go on to be able to actually meet her uh, a few years later when she came to London. Mm -hmm. And um, I was asked to go and interview her for this feminist magazine called Spare Rib that was uh, at the time. Um, and I hadn't been around in the country. I'd been in India with my mother and I just got back and I had this message saying, you know, June Jordan is in town. She only has one more day. She's finished her poetry tour, uh, which I missed. And um, uh, but there's this one interview and we'd really like, would you go and do this interview? Um, and I said, of course, you know, it was just like, wow, of course. Um, and so I went to interview her and took a bunch of flowers. And then I had like one of those tape decks that goes fool around. And, you know, and I'm not a trained journalist or anything. I was just used to write uh, for yeah. feminist magazines or. Um, and um, so I started asking her a couple of questions to just warm up. And she was polite. But um, if you had ever met June, she could also be quite stern and she could also be kind of a bit removed. And so I was like, oh, OK, uh, you know, uh, let's see where how this if she's going to warm up or not. But then I asked my third question. I remember this vividly. And I asked her this question about her project with Buckminster Fuller. Uh, mm -hmm. the Harlem Skyrise uh, project that she had envisioned um, and that she had gone to Buckminster Fuller, the futurist architect, with this idea um, of completely radically reimagining Harlem. And, and I remember reading that essay in Civil Wars about how that came to be, yes. which was that, you know, it was a year after the Harlem riots in 1964, and she wrote this thing where she says, you know, that I, after the riot, she was just consumed with hatred for white people. And she's walking around with this hatred. And she was like, but I can't go on with this. I can't live in this hatred. I have to find a way out of this. Um, and so she was inspired to rethink of how to redesign or to have to redesign Harlem um, so that it would have be a space for black people to be able to live with joy, to be able to live in love, to have public footpaths, as she said, that had trees. That so it was this kind of radical imagination of hers that you know I I just really was in, deeply inspired by and completely compelled by who this person was. I love uh, this story. Gives me chills. Um, because it brings together so many conversations, so many intellectual communities. Um, 
you know, and uh, and I agree. Civil Wars is is I have not read a, a, another book like Civil Wars in its structure, in its 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 power and incisiveness. Um, and I can see, and it 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 hits me in my heart, right? Um, and I so you know, so you've talked about how you met June and came to understand her work. Um, how did uh, how did you then decide uh, and and get June on board with the idea of making a film that would be a reassessment of the movements of the '60s? Um, centering black feminist voices. Yeah. Um, well, um, again, this is sort of, you know, when after I'd met June, um, I'd said to her, why are your books not available here in the UK? And uh, she said, well, I don't know. So I said, you know, well, let's make them available here in the, there in the United Kingdom. I lived in the UK at the time. And um, I had worked in a feminist publisher. So I had some contacts with some feminist publishers. And I took uh, her writings to Virago Press, which is a feminist publishing house, and got two volumes of her poetry published. Um, and so she came over. Uh, and that was within almost a, a year to 18 months of meeting her. Um, and the, she came back to London to do a poetry tour with those to launch the books, a book tour. And she stayed with us. Um, and one of her desires was to go to Paris. Uh, she said, I have to go to Paris, you know. So we said, okay, well, let's go to Paris. And so June and myself and Shaheen, my partner, uh, we all went off to Paris. And then on our way there, she said, oh, it's great. Uh, you know, I have a friend who's going to be par in Paris at the same time, and we're going to uh, probably have dinner with her. And we said, OK, fine. And the friend turned out to be Angela Davis. Uh, and it was like, OK, you know, uh, it was quite a moment uh, for us. And for me, um, you know, Angela, before June, I had read Angela. Uh, I had read uh, this uh, collection uh, that she'd edited and written in called Voices of Resistance, if they come in the morning. And I remember reading that as a young woman before I even went to university and somebody had given me that book. Um, and um, I had, again, it had really sort of shifted my worldview in a really fundamental way because my parents were immigrants to England and they we were economic refugees. My mother worked in a sweatshop um, and was exploited. Um, and I saw so many South Asian people and black people from the Caribbean who were ex-Commonwealth citizens, you know, who had come uh, to to the UK and working in these menial jobs. Um, and so Angela's writings and that book really opened me up to questions around race and gender mm -hmm. and class and particularly class uh, in a way that I didn't really have the language for before. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that that book and Angela's words really gave me that first turning point politicization moment. In, in my life because I was able to then understand what was happening to my mother and the lives of other South Asian women who were working in factories. And, um, and you know, so, uh, so, Angela, to, so then to meet Angela with June Jordan in Paris was just like, you know, I couldn't have written that movie, you know, the way it happened. Um, and we spent the weekend together and we hung out, the, uh, the four of us in, in Paris. And I remember one thing that happened that was, uh, you know, it was just so special in so many ways. But one thing that happened is we'd gone out for a late night dinner in the Algerian area. I can't remember which area of Paris that is right now. And we were trying, and it was raining and we were trying to get a taxi to take us back to our hotels. And no taxi would stop for us. Mm -hmm. No taxi stopped for us. Finally, a taxi stopped um, and we got our taxis and we got to our hotel. The next morning, June knocked on our uh, hotel room and she had the scroll of the, she used to write on these yellow legal pads. And so she had scrolled this yellow a page of that pad with a little ribbon on it. And 
presented it to us and she said, good morning, and then kind of smiled and went off. And it was a poem that she'd written literally overnight mm. about the four of us, women of color, trying to get a taxi <laughs> in Paris. And it's in one of her collections, this poem, you know. Um, and it was, you know, this was who June was, that she would take these experiences and then create these poems. And she was, I would say, in a way that her art and her words and her poetry were like this daily resistance to our indispensability as women of color, you know. Um, and uh, so anyway, we came away from that weekend and I was sort of really struck by how June had this kind of very poetical way of trying to make sense of the world and how Angela came from a very different tradition, political tradition. You know, she'd been a member of the Communist Party and that she'd been part of the, the Black Power Resistance Movement, had been there, uh, you know, fighting for the Soledad Brothers. And I thought that the here are two women with very different approaches to political change. Mm -hmm. And what would it be like to have them in conversation, but visually in terms of their life stories mm -hmm. in a film, which both highlighted and illuminated and amplified their personal stories, but within the context of the movement of the civil rights movement and the movement for change, uh, social and political change here in the US. Um, because I don't, you know, for me, I've often been asked, uh, particularly here in the US, that what was my connection as a South Asian woman to this history, the, you know, the Black Power movement history, the civil rights history. One of the things I think that many people don't realize is that these movements were not localized. They had reverberations globally. You know, they inspired uh, movements in India, you know, they inspired uh, some of the movements of li for liberation in some of the African countries who were fighting for independence. And um, so I think this kind of global impact of those liberation movements was, you know, uh, something that I think really resonated for me and that I then wanted it to kind of be captured and documented. What did these women have to say about stories from their own lives? I love how you've you phrased that because I think one of the sort of the, you know one of the key um, you know, the, the power of and of a place to rage is the are um, is the articulation of you know, women of color feminism as at once rooted in the legacy of black women's organizing in the civil rights and black power movements in the US um, and you know routed right to use to use Paul Gilroy's ropes and roots right rooted through a commitment to an intersectional internationalist feminism and I think your film reflects and also produces that politics right while also concretizing and, and making explicit the many intellectual and activist legacies and affinities of women of color, feminism in that moment. Um, and I, I know that was one of the things that was so exciting for me was to witness um, you know, these, these important figures in conversation um, you know, about women of color feminism in the 1990s um, and the way it was important, not only to organizing in the United States, but really as understanding it as having, um, having such importance for a global politics of justice. Um, and I, I'd love for you to say a little bit about um, how, how you visualize that, the, the, the kinds of choices, aesthetic choices you make in in the film um, as you know as both a documentary but as a kind of um, you know love letter and a celebration of friendship and um, you know and I think also um, you know I, I love all of the ways in which we we witness you know June Angela um, you know Minha um, and, and Alice Walker kind of doing their thing, right, in their elements. 
Um, and so if you could talk a little bit about, um, about how you, how you, you do, you visualize, um, those connections, affinities and politics. Um, well, <laughs> um, where do I begin really? Um, I guess, um, I start from just wanting to talk to them. You know, I think that, uh, for me, it was, um, that was the starting point. Um, I had so many questions for both of them, um, individually and also together. Um, and so I started with asking them about their ex experience of being politicized, uh, their experience of what were the moments in their lives that gave birth to their own kind of growing consciousness and what led them to become the poet and the political activists that they both were. Um, and what was not just the kind of ways in which they um, saw what was happening around them, but what, what was it within their own selves that they kind of, that motivated them? Um, you know, one of the things that Angela says in the film, she says that, you know, she never would have made, if she'd had a choice, she never would have made a choice to lead the kind of life that she did in the public eye as a political activist. And, you know, that to me is so resonant because it's also saying that so many black women did not have a choice about how to live their lives and what to focus on, that this became a political necessity as a way to survive, not just for you as an individual, but also for you to kind of really, you know, for your people and for your communities. Um, and so my approach as a filmmaker was really first and foremost to be in conversation with them, to talk to them, to get their stories, to get their trajectories of, of how and what and what their development, development as individuals were. But also I think that, you know, it was really important to me because I got to know both of them uh, particularly and uh, to capture the kind of uh, daily texture of their lives and to kind of include these kind of quotidian moments of, you know, what are seemingly like, oh, you know, Angela running in the Redwoods forest, uh, you know, June playing tennis or all of these things that were, would be seen as being, oh, that's just part of this other part of their lives. And then they are political activists on this other you know, compartmentalizing. Normally people are compartmentalized these different aspects. And as a filmmaker, it was important to me to kind of capture in the visual representation of who these women are and in their celebration, uh, the sort of the nuance and the kind of holisticness of their lives. And so that it became like, how did they, um, feed their inner resilience? How did they feed their inner grace? How did they, you know, the self-care, um, whether they called it that, that or not, you know, the self-care that they did, how did that, how was that generative for their art and for their activism? Um, and so that, you know, as June says, rather than be hardened in a place of hate, be, you know, rejoice in, the in a sense of optimism and in a sense of joy that change is possible. So I think I, yeah, that's just one kind of ways in which I was thinking about how I wanted to visually represent mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. who they were and their stories. I love that. And, and certainly um, uh, the images of Angela running um, are among my favorite. <laughs> Um, in the film, um, and you know, you also you know make really great use of music, um, of dance, um, your attention to geographies in the film, um, uh, and also um, you know the the set design, right? And having this kind of um, you know uh, this space that is um, sort of watched over by all portraits of, um, you know, of black women, you know, I think from mostly from the, the that book, I Dream a World. Yes. Um, yeah. Which was also a featured feature in my household. Um, you know, <laughs> um, yeah. 
And so, you know, and I, so, and it's not, it's not a traditional documentary in that way. And, um, you know, and so just how, like thinking about how, where this film fits into um, not only your development as an intellectual um, uh, and, you know, an activist, but also where it fits into your development as a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I didn't go to film school and I have a, no formal training in filmmaking. So I've always said, you know, that I have really learned uh, my uh, craft and art as a filmmaker through just making films mm -hmm. and being influenced by a whole number of different kinds of forms. So not just the moving image, but also literary forms, political forms, also uh, art installation, music, you know, all of these things. And I also grew up on Bollywood films. Mm -hmm. So for me, dance is an important part of storytelling. Music is an important part of storytelling. And so I think the kind of my formal approach to uh, this particular documentary was not a traditional documentary because I you know, I don't really know how to make a traditional documentary. Uh, I, I think that I, for me, documentary filmmaking is, should be and is as exciting visually and aesthetically as narrative or as any other kind form of moving image work. Um, and so I wanted to include a multiplicity of visual visualizations within the film. Um, and also with music, and you asked about music, you know, for me, music is a sort of a really crucial kind of part of the uh, storytelling. It's a narrative within, within the film. So, you know, we have, um, I mean, I, I, okay. So I think that, you know, within the US, Black music in many ways has always narrativized injustices. You know, um, if I think about how, you know, Nina Simone's, you know, Mississippi Goddamn or Billie Holiday's Strange Fruit, they're these iconic anthems, you know. And I remember, I mean, listening to, if you just think about listening to John Coltrane and his uh, album Birdland, which was a response to you know, one of the tracks, particularly, I think was a response to the bombing of the uh, church in Birmingham, Alabama, and the killing of those four girls. And I remember listening to that and thinking about, and just being so moved, deeply moved by these kind of saxophone riffs that go off into this deep pain and grief, but then moves out into some moments of hope and joy. And like, this kind of ability of the music to be able to na both narrow narrativize the injustices but also capture the spirit of survival um, it was kind of something deeply influential on me and so when i was thinking about the music for a place of rage i i felt that it was really important to include some of the music that was of that time that mm -hmm. acted as music of resistance and so that too became a kind of narrative of resistance through the music mm. in the film. Wow, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, something you just said about the, the multiplicity of visualities as well. Um, really, you know, it, it's, it, it's reminding me again, of sort of something else that really spoke to me, um, you know, as a younger person, um, you know, in that moment was always wanting um, that the, you know, the opposite of a, of a negative image is not a positive image, but a multiplicity of images. And so, so what was so important also about, you know, whether we call it the multicultural moment or the, you know, the, the articulation of women of color feminism in that moment was the possibility of, you know, how do we hold, you know, multiple voices um, and differences and distinctions um, together as part of our narratives. Um, and I really appreciate that in, in the film as well. Um, I wanted to also ask you, re-watching it, I, um, 
you know, was struck by just how many, you know, now that I'm, I'm, I'm older and more educated, right, um, how many, um, the, the, the breadth of collaboration in the film. Um, so not just your collaboration with, with June and Angela and Alice uh, and Minha, um, but I was also thinking of um, Shaheen's work um, as set designer. I was thinking about the seeing the work of um, Marie Johnson Calloway, who was a, who was a Bay Area uh, Black woman artist, installation artist. Um, I was excited to see Colleen Smith's name as a production assistant. Um, you know, and, and thinking about, um, you know, what role collaboration plays, collaboration community played in the making of A Place of Rage um, and in your practice more broadly. Yeah, that was great that you noticed that Marie Johnson Calloway's piece in the film. You know, um, for me, uh, making films is a kind of collaborative process. Uh, you know, I, I may have the idea, I may have the vision, but everyone who works with me is my collaborator. Mm -hmm. And it was really important to me that, you know, I mean, that uh, piece by Maria Calloway Johnson was really something that happened in the moment because I was shooting in the Bay Area and I had gone to see an exhibition in which this piece of hers was there. And it was this piece where she has a, a figure of Rosa Parks and a sewing machine and she's so, sewing is her homage to Rosa Parks. And it was so moving, again, in this kind of very everyday quotidian way that it was just this kind of, you know, uh, what was the texture of Rosa's life as, as a seamstress uh, before she became known in that way. And, and I just really wanted to have that in the film. Um, and then I had come across those photographs by uh, I, I, I Dream a World. Um, and I just thought I have to have these photographs. We couldn't afford to clear any rights. And, uh, uh, but, you know, the photographer gave us permission. So, uh, you know, all credit to him for, for doing that. Um, uh, and I think, you know, I had, I mean, I had uh, wanted to ensure, and I try and do this with every film, and that those were early days, but right from the beginning, I was kind of, nobody taught me how to make films, and I had to learn to do it myself. So I want to create these opportunities for other younger women of color, if they want to have experience of working on a set. So I had reached out and said to my contacts in the Bay Area, if there's anyone any young women who want to kind of get some experience and want to come and work on the set. And so I think Colleen Smith was at the time at uh, SFSU. Mm -hmm. And so she, as a result of my kind of reaching out, she was one of the people who turned up and wonderful to see from there to now the incredible work that she has done. I mean, I'm just so in awe of what she has uh, the work that she's done and the kind of, uh, the sort of the exciting kind of, you know, uh, ways in which she's engaged with, uh, with her art uh, practice and her political practice. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's really important to me to, to uh, sort of be collaborative always as a filmmaker and not just with the people who I'm working with, uh, like who on screen, but also all, everyone behind the screen and particularly to open up spaces for experiences for young women of color in 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 the in in the film and, and in the film world definitely mm -hmm. yeah. and certainly you know obviously as as viewers um, you know um, you know was, you know that I um, after college I worked briefly at Women Make Movies the feminist film distribution company um, and so got my sort of education. Um, just, you know, sitting in the distribution closet, <laughs> watching many of these films and, and, you know, learning your work and others. And, um, you know, and I think that um, it's certainly the impact that that sense of, um, I felt spoken to um, by the film. I felt, you know, even though I wasn't a collaborator in the room, um, it helped me definitely understand both the political um, stakes of 
um, you know, of, of black feminist analyses, um, you know, in assessing our, our movements and, um, uh, you know, our, our goals for the future, and also the importance um, of, of women of color telling our own stories and making yeah. And being able to to share those those um, you know our 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 standpoints with yeah, with, yeah. with others and ourselves. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I think that you know, part of me that for me it's really crucial that there's a kind of a intimacy that gets translated on screen, and that intimacy then gets translated to the audiences, so that you know um, we. It is, it's important to me that we're not, like I'm not creating this kind of space of observation of these women's lives, but a space of engagement with who they are and with their lives. So that there is a kind of a way in which that allows for it, precisely what you said, a kind of an opening for women to, or any audiences to enter into that visual space and to be able to claim or a, a kind of, a a, a sort of a, um, a kind of connection uh, so that there's not judgment being made as an objective viewer, but that there is a kind of a, a intimate contact with what mm -hmm. these women were saying. I mean, one of the things that happened because I made the film for Channel 4 television in England at the mm -hmm. time, uh, you know, it could not be made now for sure, but at the time there was a tiny opening where they were encouraging uh, vo independent voices and particularly women of color and people of color voices on for mainstream television. I managed to sneak it, it sneak in with this film and it was shown on primetime television. And at that time, it was over a million people who watched it, which is a huge number at that time and for that particular slot. But I remember stories being told by friends that they will be, one friend told me the story of how they were waiting at a bus stop the next morning. And these two women, black women of Caribbean origin, were talking to each other and saying, did you see that film? Did you see that film? Wasn't that incredible? It was so amazing to see those women, the, you know, and to me, that was just like, yes, you know, this is about the fact that, you know, that invisibility, the lack of representation that I felt that particularly in the early 90s, that there was so little visibility of women of color stories, black women stories on mainstream television. And to make this film as an intervention into that space, was a really important intervention for me as a filmmaker and to then have that kind of impact, uh, which was a, a kind of a really, um, it was a nourishing. I think the film was quite nourishing for a mm. lot of people. Absolutely. And, and, and queer black women's stories. And I think that also was, you know, um, in thinking about how prescient the film is um, for that. And I was, you know, thinking um, the recent film um, that's a kind of reassessment of Eyes on the Prize, um, uh, the Eyes on the Prize Hallowed Ground, um, but also think, thinking at how a place of rage, you know, emerges in that moment, right? And the need to kind of reassess um, the movements of the past from from the view of the present, right, um, yes. and centering exactly those voices yeah. uh, and experiences that have have been marginalized. Yeah. Um, I would say I, so. I want to ask um, in conclusion, um, looking back now, thirty years, and I'm I'm so glad that we get to celebrate um, thirty years of this film with you. Um, what what has been the impact of, the, of A Place of Rage on you and your, your life? What lessons have you learned from that film? Um, wow. Um, I mean, so many things, you know, uh, I found uh, that film was uh, sort of very nurturing for me as a filmmaker. Um, it uh, helped me to find my voice as a filmmaker. It helped me to be much more um, sort of lasered, focused about the kinds of films I wanted to make. 
um, and you know how I wanted to spend my time as a filmmaker, what kind of stories I wanted to tell, because I saw the impact of A Place of Rage on so many different kinds of people. And I think that one of the other things that I would never ever would have even imagined, um, and which is kind of the role of documentary film, the role of the moving image mm -hmm. as a kind of repository of memory, as a repository of sort of certain kinds of historical um, experiences, historical uh, subjects, you know, certain moments in, in history. You know, I never would have thought about when I was making the film that what, what that meant, what this means, having this film when June Jordan is no longer with us. Mm -hmm. And to realize that this is one of the very few visual documentations of June Jordan in her breath, in, in her expansiveness, uh, both in voice and with her poetry and in, in who she was in her everyday life. And, you know, at the time that I was making the film, you know, that was never even a consideration that how this film would become an important and a crucial documentation of June, June Jordan at a particular moment in her life, speaking about her own life in her own words, rather than someone else kind of interpreting it. Um, so I think that that's had a big impact on me, you know, 30 years on to think that, um, wow, this, you know, I can still hear June's giggle you know, which she giggles in the film and her laughter and 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 what she had to say is just as, as you said, is just as crucial and prescient now as it was at that time, you know. I think that the kind of the systems of injustices, the systems of, you know, incarceration that Angela talks about, all of those things, 30 years on, you know, yes, we've had this incredible Black Lives Matter movement, which has again had like this incredible global resonance, you know, um, that in Iceland with very few Black people, there were thousands of people who marched for Black lives. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of moment that gave, that gave people hope for change is also those are the moments that people like June Jordan and Angela Davis have over the years given us that hope um, with their words and their activism. So I think that, you know, um, the impact on me has been profound. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad that um, hopefully, uh, you know, a whole group, new group of folks will get to experience this film. Um, it really is a gift. Pratiba, thank you. Thank you, Lee. Thank you for taking me back all those years. <laughs> Thank you. Okay.